Meet Oscar. Oscar is a happy little fox terrier. Oscar! Who just loves to play. Unfortunately, there are some games he can't play because Oscar is blind. The lenses in his eyes slipped out of place and they had to be removed. Poor little Oscar is a victim of his inheritance. He has inherited a faulty gene. Unfortunately, it's common in terriers. Somewhere in this line of dogs, there's a tragic defect that keeps getting passed around. Why? What causes it? Is there anything that can be done about it? As yet, we cannot help Oscar, but soon it may be possible because inheritance is a mystery we're beginning to explain. Let's start with what we can see. When we watch a cell divide, we see something strange happening in the nucleus. Little sausage shapes appear. These are chromosomes, already copied and double. Moved by invisible threads, they line up in the center of the cell, split apart and go off each way. Then the cell divides. This is mitosis, the simple division of cells. If you like, it's cloning, because the two new cells are copies of each other. It's how most bacteria reproduce. It's how our bodies grow. It's asexual reproduction. But many animals and plants also reproduce sexually. This animation shows the crucial difference. Again, we see the already duplicated chromosomes appear with their joined in the middle double sausage shape. But now they line up two by two, revealing that they each have a special partner. At this moment, they may swap bits of material, a process called crossing over. Then the partners move to the center and division occurs. But the chromosomes themselves don't split, only the partners separate. They then line up by themselves on the centers of the two new cells, and two become four. Thus the chromosomes are finally split into singles, as with mitosis. But it isn't exactly the same in this sexual process, which is called meiosis because they've lost their partners and are thus down to half the normal number. These are special cells called germ cells. In a male, they're sperm. In a female, they're eggs. Fertilization, of course, when a sperm combines with an egg, restores the chromosomes to the original number by supplying new partners. The complete arrangement, laid out in pairs, is called the organism's carrier type. Each species has its own number of pairs. It's all very neat, but the obvious question is why? Well, it was in a glass house like this that the answers were first guessed. An Austrian monk called Gregor Mendel crossbred pea plants and meticulously recorded the results. Now his first experiment was to grow pea plants from wrinkled seeds and cross these with pea plants grown from these smooth seeds. In the first generation, all the seeds came out smooth and he planted them. When they grew up, he let them pollinate themselves and they produced a second generation of 7,324 peas. And he counted every single one. You see, we gardeners are patient people. This time, a quarter had become wrinkled again. Mendel said there had to be two factors involved here, one in the pollen and one in the egg, and these were combined at fertilization. The resulting peas contained both of these factors. Smooth factor was stronger than wrinkle factor. So even if a pea only got one smooth factor, it would still look smooth. That explained why the first generation were all smooth. They had to be mixed factors. But the factors never disappeared. And in the second generation, there was a one in four chance that wrinkle would combine with wrinkle again. This indicated, Mendel said, that the characteristics of an organism were made up by two hidden 
but constant factors that were randomly mixed together. Later, when chromosomes were seen, it was thought that they were Mendel's two factors because of the way they behaved in fertilization. But there aren't many chromosomes. A human has only 23 pairs, a pea 14, a dog 39. It's obvious that the number of chromosomes is totally inadequate to describe all the characteristics of an organism. It would take thousands. So what was the story? Maybe, somehow, each chromosome was a package of factors. How such tiny objects could do this was unknown. But with Mendel's mysterious factors, now given the name of genes, from the Greek meaning to give birth to, the hunt was on to find them. Biochemists soon found that the nucleus containing the chromosomes was a mixture of protein and DNA. But which contained the genes? The protein or the DNA? A clever experiment gave the answer. It was DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. At last the focus was down to a single compound. This stringy stuff, which you can separate out from any living tissue in your own kitchen, if you like, had to be responsible for four things, if it was going to qualify as genetic. First, it had to be able to store a lot of information. Second, it had to be able to make copies of this information. Third, it somehow had to express this information to make an organism. And fourth, there needed to be some way of damaging this information. Remember Oscar the dog? Could DNA do it? The answer is yes, 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 and yes. Here's the amazing facts about DNA. DNA is a polymer. Its monomers are called nucleotides. They are variations on a phosphate group bonded to a 5-carbon sugar, deoxyribose. The variations are four nitrogen-containing bases and they all attach to the same place on the sugar ring. There's thymine with a single 2-nitrogen ring called a pyrimidine. There's cytosine, also a pyrimidine, which is similar. Then there's adenine, a double ring with four nitrogens called a purine. And finally there's guanine, another purine double ring. It all looks very complicated. Yet what matters is simple. These monomers bond together like a child's building set. The sugar phosphates link up to form the spine of the polymer. It makes a long strand with the bases hanging out as side chains. Immediately we can see how a macromolecule, thousands of nucleotides long, could be used to store information in the patterns of the four different base units sticking out along it. After all, computers store information as only two different units, zero and one, and they do very well. The language of DNA has four letters to play with. Thymine, let's just call it T, adenine, A, cytosine, C, and guanine, G. DNA's letters are T, A, C, and G. So DNA can be used as an information store. But there are lots of other polymers out there with patterns of monomers, so this ability is far from unique. Let's ask the second question, which is much tougher. How can DNA make copies of this information? The answer is in the arrangement of atoms at the ends of the four bases. Nitrogen and oxygen are electronegative atoms, and they attract nearby hydrogens. The bases have just the right atomic arrangements for an A to attract and hydrogen bond with a T, and a G with a C. 
This is reinforced by the fact that T is a short base bonding to A, which is long, and C and G likewise. That means it's always the joining of a short to a long, never two shorts or two longs. So the sugar phosphate groups of nucleotide pairs are always positioned at the correct place to form a matching chain going the other way. DNA forms a two-chain polymer with A's linking across to T's and C's to G's. One strand is the mirror image of the other with the same pattern of bases reflected a to T, C to G, and vice versa. This is the famous double helix of DNA. To copy a complete helix, it is first unzipped and primed by enzymes. The free base ends now select their correct partners from DNA building blocks floating around nearby. Then another enzyme, DNA polymerase, bonds the sugar phosphate groups as they line up, making the polymer backbone of a new helix. If you like, its job is to zip the double helix up again. With a similar process working on the other unzipped strand, the DNA has acted as a template to build two double helixes, each half new. In effect, the information has been copied. We can in fact duplicate DNA in a test tube as well. There are lots of situations such as in crime detection or fossil testing where we only have a tiny amount of DNA, maybe nothing more than a smear of blood or a fragment of bone. We can however copy this DNA into enough to use for testing. For example, this handkerchief contains a smear of blood. All we need to do is cut that tiny section out like so and put it into a mixture of DNA building blocks, primers and DNA polymerase which you can see at the bottom of the tube. We then place the tube into this machine. To unzip the DNA contained in this tiny amount of blood the machine first heats the sample up to 90 degrees Celsius. That splits the helix into its two chains. It is then cooled to 55 degrees and the primers attached to the ends. And at 75 degrees, the polymerase slides down the DNA like a zipper, bonding the free nucleotides. Remember that A selects T and C selects G and vice versa. In a few minutes, the DNA is copied. The machine continues the process over and over again and every time it does, the DNA duplicates. So, in the first cycle, one molecule becomes two, in the next cycle, two molecules become four, and in the next, four become eight, and so on. This is called the polymerase chain reaction, and this is a PCR machine. Of course, only a single copy process takes place before a cell division. A chromosome that we see is two identical molecules of DNA recently copied and bound in the center. We now know that each of these molecules is a long, long thread of DNA made up of millions upon millions of nucleotides. It's an incredible feat of dense packaging so that after cell division it can unpack and invisibly do its work in the cell nucleus again. But what is that work? We still have two vital questions to be answered. How does the DNA carry and express the genes? And how may the information be corrupted? What is the story hidden in Oscar? Online teaching resources to support this program are available at abc.net.au slash schools tv.